more slides than I know what to do with. Looking inside my brain is what this is called. Hopefully, um, it gives you a chance to understand what I've been doing in my study in our school. And also, I want to talk about um, school climate. I want to have some summer fun. Hopefully, um, we can do that. Um, I know quite a bit of that. I went to a session this morning um, about growth mindset and found myself on the slide. Uh, <laughs> um, we've been working on growth mindset for about three or four years, and we've come to the position of, of a piece of um, research from Jaeger, Cohen, and Walter, Walter and Cohen. Actually, making the effort isn't just enough. And I, I knew that, and I was a, I tried to be a golf professional when I was about 18. That actually, if you just stood there all day hitting shots, all you did was get your shoulders out of kilter. Can you see that? I'm not putting that on. That's Alice just standing there. If you just did that and only that and just practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced, you didn't get better. Um, so exhorting kids just to work harder isn't enough because actually if they work harder and don't improve, they just get fed up. Um, so you have to have strategies to help them make that improvement. And so what we're doing at the moment is having three, we've got three, F, three strands now to our growth mindset approach. It is making the effort, but it's also from great feedback and also having strategies for improvements. It's just what David Cameron was saying it's about making sure our students have these strategies about how to learn. That was, I, I, I teach two A level economics groups, ASF economics groups, back in February. That was the overwhelming grade they got in their mocks, right? <laughs> like the vast majority of them got a grade U. And uh, that's at the back of some shit results the year before. So I was under pressure. Um, and I'd really worked hard on my, on my teaching. I'd changed the teaching. I'd, I'd read Willingham, and I'd done a bit of um, uh, The Hidden Lives of Learners by Nuttall. And I'd really focused um, to, to, to kind of teach differently. And I still got a great year, and I didn't know what to do. So I thought, they know the economics. I've taught them the economics. They know about shifts in demand curves and supply curves. I know they know it. But in their assessment, and in the end, in their assessment, it's what well, they've got to make that assessment. They've got to be assessed somehow. They were getting terrible marks. So I'm a big fan, as a head and as a teacher, of the Sutton Trust Toolkit. And so I went to the Sutton Trust Toolkit, and I thought, what is it that I'm not doing? What interventions help learners that I'm not involved in? And, I, and I'm not using. Um, so I went there and I, and I put them in order. And of course the top one there is metacognition and self-regulation. So I read up a bit about what that was. And in a sense, it's, it's, uh, they're posh words for, for the kids having control of their mind and the way they regulate their, their learning. Um, so what they do in an exam room and how they, they, they control their brain about what to do when they don't know what to do, when they're under pressure, and when they come to do an, ex an, an exam paper. And if I think about when I'm in an exam, when I'm taking an exam paper, I've always been really good at exams, my brain's on fire thinking about what I need to do to get the most marks. How do I, how do I tackle this piece of assessment? And I've trained my brain over years doing that, but we don't ever train our children to do that and how to think really, really explicitly um, when they're taking an examination <coughs> with a question they find difficult. So, what I did was by myself one of those. I'd seen some people around school, seen Kieran Cause and use them, um, and they'd called um, visualizers, right? You get them really relatively cheap now. And what I did was give back the mock paper. But I gave back the mock paper blank. I gave them just a, a, a blank mock paper. They'd already taken it, they'd done the economics to it, but what I did was talk them through question by question, what I was thinking, and got them to write down what I was thinking. So I was sitting here, going through the paper, writing on the paper, not the answers, but what my brain was thinking. So that's why I called this looking inside my brain. And then they were writing that down verbatim as I wrote it down on my exam paper. Next lesson, without any warning, because I teach period three and it goes into lunch, I gave them a completely new mock. And the results were stunning. And the results were up three or four grades. Oliver went up from grade U to a grade A. I taught them no more economics. I taught them no more content. I just taught them how to think in the exam when they were faced with questions. 
So that's, that's what my, my kind of paper looked like. So I'm going, it's a question about shifts in supply and demand, and I'm saying check labels, check the labels, check, 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 check. Because if you don't put price and quantity on there, you get zero for that, even if you've got everything else completely right. So you must check your labels. And I'm saying how many demand and supply shifts are there? Answer two. Am I sure I know which way they go? That's what's going on in my head when I'm tapping that question. Not the answer. So, Olive went up five grades. And there's Ollie's retaken full mark answer. And you can see what I've, I've highlighted, where he's doing the thinking that I was doing. So what he'd learned was not the economics, he'd learned the thinking that I was going, the brain checks in my head, how do I do that, how do I do it? So he's done labels, have I labeled it? Yes, check. Um, where's the original line? Check. Where's the new line? Check. Have I done the arrows? Check. Is it supply, supply, not demand? And then his piece of writing is utterly sparse and correct um, and economical, to use a phrase. Beautiful. So he'd gone up from a U to an O without teaching any more content. I just taught him how to think under pressure. And I think possibly claim to explicitly taught that. I showed on my blog, Tim Burnish, my music teacher, one of my music teachers, did the same. He said, I've tried your idea. They've made significant progress. So and so moved from a U to an A. Half the group went up three grades. It works. Thanks for sharing. There's his paper. He did the same thing. The question, I think, was on space oddity. This track was recorded in 1969, outlined three musicals <laughs> and or technological features that support this statement. He'd written down there on the right, mm. <laughs> I'm thinking, what do I know about that? This is tricky. <laughs> Uh, 1969, not sure. What can I hear that seems a bit unusual? Technological, full sort of qualities, music, 1960s, hippies, landing on the moon, oh, it's called Space Oddity. Right? So that, what he modelled there for, that, for his A-level group was how he would think if he came across a question that he didn't know how to approach. I've been working really hard with the maths department. Um, I, I line manage the maths department. I'm a, I'm a trained English teacher. I can do a bit of maths, I'm going to show you a bit of maths in a second. And I've been working on just five unbelievably simple stages to attack a question. To, to give our students, no matter what their background and what their abilities, tools to unpick these questions when they don't know what to do. It's what, exactly what David Cameron said earlier. It's about if you get the last question right, you get the most difficult question right. You can do any question if you've got the toolkit for approaching them. So you reread the question. We read the question again, circle the key points. We don't use highlighters. Never, never, never use highlighters because it's just colouring in. Bad highlighters. Because they don't think when they use the highlighters. They? they don't. It's a kind of, it's like a little security blanket highlighters. Get rid of them. Um, write out, this is a really crucial moment when you're doing a maths question, is to write out the information from the question. Lots of our students cannot do maths because they can't. Um, process the information in the English. Look at what I've then have a then step back and have a look at in front of me what I've got to work out, what I've got to do to find the answer, and then lay it out really clearly. And what I do, um, I do a lot of co-planning with my colleagues. Excuse um, me, can you go back Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do lots of co-planning with my colleagues. Um, and I love co-planning. We'll, um, and when I'm in the lesson, I, I'll, talk, I'll talk about observations later. I don't come in and observe with a clipboard. I'm like um, a, sli a slightly uh, um, dull, grey-haired, slightly paunched um, TA who goes around <laughs> and just how. Um, so, going on, if I'm allowed to go on. So, we find Lisa's lesson. She'd done her mock. Um, they've got the GCSE Year 11 mock, and she was giving feedback. She modelled a simultaneous question, they, a simultaneous equation question they'd got in the exam. She modelled how to do it. They wrote down her answers on a clean sheet, exactly as she thought it through. So they're there. She's teaching. That she's using a visualizer. The class then attempted a similar question, and then she got Callan to actually do the same thing um, for the students on the new question. Right? So they, they model it, she models it, they do a new question that's similar from a different paper, 
and then she gets her students to model it. So I think the next slide, you'll see just a little smattering of Lisa modelling the beginning of how her thinking for the question. Well, that's, her, that's her sheet, and this is her modelling. sure that you could get this question right. It's about the setting out of that work. So let's go through it step by step. So first bit, let's read through it together. A cinema sells adult tickets and child tickets. The total cost of three adult tickets and one child ticket is £30. The total cost of one adult ticket and three child tickets is £22. Work out the cost of an adult ticket and the cost of of a child ticket. So you've read through it once. Hopefully at that stage you're thinking, what method am I going to use? Steve has already mentioned simultaneous equations. Yes? Okay, it's recognising what the question is about, just that first read through. So then the next time you read through it, let's make sure we're circling, we're underlining those key issues. It's not just about quickly highlighting and moving on and trying to get the answer, it's about taking a step at a time. Full mark question, at least four minutes on it. Okay. So, take the first bit. What's the most important bit? Well, it's the fact that it's about adult tickets and child tickets. Two different types of tickets there. It then says the total cost of three adult tickets and one child ticket is £30. Have we all circled? We've all underlined. We've seen what the key bits of information are. Okay, you get the idea. She, goes, she takes her through really slowly, really steadily. Then Callum did the next question, which is a new question. And this is just the end of Callum taking the whole class through how to do this simultaneous equation. Times three equals two thousand. So that's fourteen hundred add six hundred, and that does equal two thousand. Uh, you write that in. So T equals seven hundred, and C equals two hundred. Simultaneous equations, Callum. Honestly, honestly, absolutely fabulous. Well done. Right, so you get the idea of, of what we did. Um, and the improvement was immense. The level of improvement. Not because they've got more maths, because they've just been taught how to think. So, I then went back to the toolkit. And look at the toolkit. <coughs> Eight months progress, metacognition, self-regulation. Eight months further progress, really good feedback. She was giving great feedback from the exam. And then the third most effective on the toolkit is peer tutoring. You've got one lesson with all three of them in. No wonder they made so much bloody progress in that lesson. Because she's actually featured all three of the most effective interventions according to the, 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 best, um, the, the, exist, the best meta analysis of all the research in the UK that exists. Unbelievable. All in one lesson. It was amazing. I posted it. Suddenly I've got Jen Love saying how great it is. I know he spelt it wrong. Tom, Tom said, Tom says, I've had Tom shit before, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> great piece of year seven. When I was a head teacher at Lady London's um, school, year seven, girls' toilets, Tom shit is a wanker. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. Always makes me laugh. Um, another one, another one, another one. The people were finding that that stuff, when they tried it in the classrooms, was having a phenomenal effect on the, uh, the, the uh, achievement and attainment uh, under exam conditions of their children. So, I think there's lots of evidence there, not only with the Sutton Trust Toolkit, but also my own experience, but also experience of others, that using metacognition and using the visualizer really, really works. Now, have you been watching the news? <laughs> you have known that one. Um, and there's the question. There are end sweets in a bag, blah, 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 blah. We're going to do it together now. So, you need a pen. I came up with this idea at 4 o'clock this morning. 
<laughs> I'm not going to talk over again. I'm, just... I'm not going to ask for quiet. I just expect it. Oh, right. Um, so, um, I came up with this idea. I worked at the force where I'm thinking, how can I make it slightly more interesting? Um, let's see if we can do this together. Um, I'm sure some of you have already done it and done it, whatever. I know there are some people who find it tricky. Um, it's actually, by far, it's one of the easier questions on the paper, actually if you go through it methodically. Okay, so are we ready? You've got to write, you've got to write with me. Um, I'm not going to be writing to begin with, I'm just going to read it through myself. Let's read it through together. There are N sweets in a bag. Six of the sweets are orange, the rest of the sweets are yellow. Hannah takes a random sweet from the bag. She eats the sweet. <laughs> That's really, really important. <laughs> Hannah then takes a random another sweet from the bag. She eats the sweet. The probability that Hannah eats two orange sweets is a third. Show that n squared minus n minus 9 to you equals zero. You can just imagine what they were like. Right? Okay. Um, I did see a tweet I nearly included so that Hannah can stick her sweets up her arm. Which is one of the responses afterwards. In the story. Okay, so let's, let's look at it again. There are n sweets in a bag. So the total number, let's circle this. Um, Total is equals N. Okay. Six of the sweets are orange. I'm just going to write that. Six are orange. The rest of the sweets are yellow. I'm just going to circle the yellow. Okay. Just I'm, I'm picking the, 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 the problem. Just a, uh, random is really important, so it's completely random. She eats the sweet. Now, why do they tell me that? I know why they tell me that, because it's not replaced. And I've been taught about um, whether one action is dependent on another action, and I've been taught probability. And then takes it random again, another sweep from the bag, and she eats it again, so it's not replaced again. Okay, so the probability, and there it is, it's telling me what it is. The main part of this is about probability is one third, that's one out of three. Okay, good. Show that n squared minus m minus 90 equals zero. Don't go count there, because it's zero. Okay, so, um, the total equals n, six equals orange. What do I need to do? And I know that orange then times another orange equals a third. Okay, so, if she's taken an orange sweet out of the bag, there are six of them. So she's got six out of N. Right? She's taken six out of N. Now I know that the next one, if she's not put it back in, for the next one there's only five left. And if she's taken one out, there was N, now there's only n minus 1. One's been taken away. And because the second sweep is dependent on the first, it's not a plus, it's a times. I know that those two probabilities times together equals a third. Okay, so I'm just thinking through basic probability. I've been taught basic probability hundreds of times in my lessons with my GCSE teacher. And then... What do I need to do? Well, let me do some easy stuff first. If I'm multiplying those out, 6 times 5 is 30. And I'm not going to get too complicated here, because that looks complicated. So I'm just going to keep that as n, n minus 1 for the moment. And that equals 1 third. Everybody with me so far writing that down? <laughs> okay. Now, I think it would be quite nice to keep the 1 on its own. If I want to get rid of the uh, divide by 3, I do the opposite. So I draw a line down the side, divide by 3, I do the opposite, I times by 3 to get rid of it. So I have 3 times 30, because I have to do it to both sides. 
divided by n <coughs> n minus 1 equals 1 times 3 divided by 3. So I can get rid of those two. So I'm left with 1. Okay. So 3 times 30 is 90 over n <coughs> n minus 1 equals 1. Uh, what I'm going to say now is, is, is absolutely in line. Uh, and when David um, was talk, Cameron was talking earlier, it felt um, he was kind of saying the things I was, I, I was going to say. That's fine. Because what I want to say is, is, is actually um, we should be teaching those students how to do, all our students how to do those really tough questions, the, the Hannah Sweets questions. Um, we've got to do it in a climate that doesn't become obsessive. It doesn't become penal. It doesn't create huge mental health issues. I, I know the, the, the tide has turned against the cat, right? People, you know, there has, isn't it? Right? You can feel it. And you can feel there is a certain, certain view of education that, um, a, a, and what goes on in schools that is becoming, certainly on Twitter, the new orthodoxy. Well, I just resist it, really. I still love what he says. And I don't care if I'm seen as some kind of, um, a kind of pinko lefty softy, right? This is, listen to this, this is great. An organic metaphor, I think it's going from an industrial metaphor to an back to an agricultural one. Because you think, you know, a great gardener, great farmer, depends upon plants growing under their care, otherwise they're out of business. But the irony is that every farmer and gardener knows that you cannot make a plant grow. You cannot do that. You know, I mean, you don't stick the roots on and paint the petals and attach the leaves. You know, the plant grows itself. What you do is provide the conditions for growth. And great farmers know what the conditions are and bad ones don't. Great teachers know what the conditions of growth are and bad ones don't. And with bad teaching, all this potential of students shrivels in the face of it. With great teaching, all this stuff starts to flourish into flower. And that to me is the great gift of teaching, you know, to recognize that growth is possible at any time. Like in Death Valley, you know, in the most deathless place on earth, there's life there, if you know what the conditions are. And the great challenge for teaching, I think, is not just to know your discipline, but to know your students. And to know what the pedagogical ratio is that will make them flourish and become the best thing they can be. And I, I think that it's not just something for the young. And increasingly, it's something we, see, we should see as intergenerational, rather than just something that happens at the beginning of our lives. It should endure throughout the whole of it. Thank you. And what he says there, when he says that one of the challenges for us is to know the students in front of us and the pedagogy that works for them. Um, it's exactly what I go on about all the time in our school. Just know who's in front of you. Right? Know who's in front of you. And when I read in the Times Ed last week, and it's about crap metaphors, isn't it? But there was, there was, I like Chris Bolton a lot, and I get on with him very well. But he, he wrote last week some nonsense about the Formula One car and how you've got a Formula One car driver and the technicians. And the technicians prepare the car, and the Formula One driver drives it. And the technicians, he, he had in his extended metaphor, were people like Pearsons who write textbooks and write lesson plans. And then the teacher is the one who just delivers them, like the driver. My wife said you can drive that car into a fucking wall. <laughs> <laughs> right? It doesn't work, right? Because it's, you know, it's exactly what David says. It may work in Asia, it may work in China, it may work in Singapore where, where child um, suicide rates are going through the roof, but it must, we must not let it happen in our schools. Where it's rubbish. <laughs> and when, I, when I wrote something for, for Rachel Burke, um, I wrote that first, right? and I stand by that. And I don't care what people think about me saying that, and I also said that. So you've got to do both. And I think you can only do the number 10 if you do number 1, actually. I think you can only do that. You can only do number 10 if you do number 1. And, and I said in one of my blogs um, that uh, it's about, it about teaching cheeky boys how to write. Um, and I love doing that. And it is um, a 
about love. And I talk a lot, I've, I've, I've discussed this at length with Chris Waugh, you might have seen present earlier. And he's, he, I do love that man, he's great. Um, and that's really um, the, core of, of the core of what my, my book is about. And I found this on, I found this on the web, um, 10 things that students want educators to know. And I think they're really interesting. If you look at number one, students want to know, want, want you to spend the time to get to know them. I love number 10. Um, and number 10, all students want to know their existence matters and they're important. That's what they want. They don't want to be stared with a, with a faceless Formula 1 driver churning out lessons. They want to get involved in banter. Um, <laughs> don't they? They, they, boys, boys love them. Boy, like, the best thing I ever knew was how to um, sort boys out when they farted. Right? And, and the, you know, the doorknob and the safety thing. If you ever come across that, that's fascinating. I found out about it because my, I'd go pick my son up from his girlfriend's. He'd get in the car, he'd store him up the fart all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd get in the car and fart like that and go, and go safety. And I said, what's that? He said, well, Dad, if one of my mates farts and I say doorknob before they say safety, I can hit them as hard as I want till they touch the doorknob. So we get into the car, far, touch the handle on the doorknob, and say, safety, and it will be fine. Um, so so when, Callum, when Callum Brown farted in my lesson, and I said, and I said doorknob, and now I'm going to really lamp you, um, the lad thought it was great. No one farted again. Um, and, uh, so actually understanding them and knowing who they are, you can't, you, know, you can't teach that in some textbook. You, can't, you find out because you know the kids. This guy, Stephen Hubbard, his, his, son, his son died at 26. He committed suicide at 26. And as a result, he, he founded the um, Papyrus, which is a, a charity for preventing mental health issues in the world. <coughs> and um, I think it's a really powerful thing because you know, you, you, we obsess at the moment, don't we? We obsess about inspectors and all that nonsense. And we're obsessed with every minute of every day in every class, counting, you know, some ridiculous tales that you have. But we're going to be moving away from that kind of pressurised stuff. So, like, in registration, for instance, you know, we must be doing something in registration that's education, or, you know, if an inspector comes into a registration and people aren't reading or whatever, um, there's a problem. <coughs> they might just want to chat with their mates, right? <laughs> and, I'm, and I will defend anybody. To, uh, to any any tutor who lets their ch their, their children chat in registration time, right? Because it's healthy, it's good, it's social, and sometimes you have to. You, have, you know, I I, I I feel massively like I'm swimming against the tide. I feel like I've blog once about being like like a huge dinosaur in this modern world that I just don't recognise much anymore. You know, and you look at the um, you look at the, the honours list today, it's massive academy chain heads who are getting sir this and, and dame that, and you kind of wonder what's going on with it. I, I talked last year about, um, about Demi, who was the industrialist that, that uh, took Japan out of the uh, post-war slump and was responsible for the, for the boom in the 50s and 60s. He was an, was an American industrialist, and he had 14 points and 7 deadly diseases, and one of his eighth point was drive out fear from your from your company. Um, and I, I don't really believe that. That's what my book is about, that love must triumph over fear. Um, and we have to make sure that happens in schools. Because fear is the debilitating. Fear, you know, when, when students sit down to do those exams and they're, and they're frightened, it's because they don't have the tools to do those exams. So we have to teach them those tools to, take, to tackle those exam questions. And then when it comes to teaching, oh, that's Tom Bennett. Tom Bennett took the piss out of me. <laughs> he insisted on a hug. Um, and now, you know, the only thing I like about that is I've not lost too much hair in two years. My head seems to have gone a bit flat and square. Um, but yeah, and Tom Bennett was just taking because And then when you came in, Dave, what do we do? We hug. Um, but I asked that question, you know, stuff, stuff. Mm -hmm are afraid of being judged or of being observed. We have to make the observation process <coughs> developmental. We've got to. And, I, and we do a few things that are quite different. Um, that isn't me, by the way. Um, <laughs> quite different in our school. And when it comes to observations, that's the question I ask about observations. How 
can I observe you to help you improve? I, I manage 31 teachers in our school. And I, I spend a lot of time just helping them be better. Like, I know how, how they teach. I know the strengths and weaknesses of all 112 teachers. But I, my job is to make them, help them improve and support them improving. <coughs> and you're going to get that if you've got penal systems and where they don't take risks. So one of the things I, I talk about is this, because when we go and observe lessons, um, and you, you, make some, you make some judgment at the end of the lesson, how can you? Because the whole point of teaching, the whole point of doing those interventions, is to see children's learning. And it doesn't happen in an hour. It happens over time. It happens almost invisibly. So what I do, quite often, is... I mean, I, I talk about the outcomes a lot. When I go and observe a lesson now, there are some times when I won't see the person for three or four weeks until afterwards. You know, I'd, there's no point in doing instant feedback or guaranteeing feedback by the end of the day. What's the point? What I do is say, look, in three weeks' time, when they've done the piece of writing, which they've finished as a result of that piece of teaching you've done, and that intervention you've done, let's look at their writing and see if your <coughs> intervention worked. Let's see if we can see the thread through from your teaching through to the outcomes. And so we sit down now, and Jane Ellsworth, who's a great head of, head of geography, sat down with me three weeks after I observed her, um, and we looked at the piece of writing the children had done. And it really worked. And you could see some students getting A and A star work, that they hadn't got anywhere near because of the piece of intervention she did um, when she taught the lesson that was the observation lesson. So it does make sense. I, I watched one, watched a lesson recently in year nine, coming back to the maths, where Claire Hadcroft was, was teaching year nine group how to tackle that question. Tricky, challenging question. I, I said to my maths staff, I don't want anybody in, the, in your lessons doing work they find easy and they, they can do. I want them to be failing most of the time and finding stuff really hard in maths because that's the only way you're going to get better and get further, um, further develop your, your, your practice. And what she did near the end of the lesson was give them on a piece, on, on, on a, a, a little test to see if they got that, got the concepts behind that question. And she took them in at the end on, um, on post-it notes. And at the end of that lesson that I observed, only 7 out of 30 got it. But I was really happy about that. Because what she didn't do is rush it. What she didn't do is think, I've got to get through this. What she did was use her now to think, actually, they're not learning this. They're not getting this. That's fine. I'm relaxed. It doesn't matter. It's an observation lesson. It's my performance management lesson. But it doesn't matter because I'm going to do the sensible thing. Guess who said that? Brilliant piece of wisdom. Anybody? <laughs> he said that. If only he had told his inspector mates. <laughs> um, so when Claire then did the next lesson, off the back of that first lesson, 28 out of 30 got it. Because actually that bit of learning didn't take an hour. It took actually two hours. And, and the time in between when they were going through their heads about how that works and letting that bit of learning um, kind of embed. I think in terms of mental health, there's a perfect storm. I no wonder so many of our children are having mental health problems. There's a perfect storm. The first one is that. Um, because the cuts Osborne has made is, is robbing, really robbing sent, uh, the, the, the services at local authority centre um, for things like CAMS. Our CAMS provision in our city is next to useless. Right? So schools have got to do it for themselves. Performance-related pay, right? That pressure in really poorly, poorly led and poorly managed schools, where everything is decided upon some cliff-edged judgment. The pressure's ridiculous. Just on having terminal examinations now, we have to train our students to have memory skills and have all those examinations. No more um, control assessments in secondary. No more coursework. That pressure's huge. And the exams, as you've just seen, with the maths are getting harder. And then lastly, um, the social media. My son is never down. He has no, no downtime. When my youngest persuades me in the end to get in the loft and get the Lego out, 
right? And we tip it out, the big box on our floor in the bedroom. The 18-year-old will slink in on a Saturday morning and have two hours amongst the bricks as well, because there's actually still a little boy. Um, but they're both online all the time, and it's just corrosive. So all those things together, it's no wonder we have a mental health problem amongst our kids. This is a really useful booklet. It came out in, Mar in March um, from Public Health England. Um, and that's the rationale, look at that rationale. That's back, really, back in the back, sorry. It's a really helpful booklet. Um, it's certainly underpinning a lot of the work that I'm doing in school now um, to look at our pastoral system again. <laughs> that's what it says about an average class of 30, 15 year olds. We've got a number of our students who haven't made it through for one reason or another to the end of their GCSEs, I'm sure other secondaries have here. Um, and there are eight, eight um, kind of strands to that, to that booklet, and I think that one is most important, actually. If the leadership management of the school doesn't take mental health issues seriously, both for staff and for students, um, then you've really got no hope. But if they do take it seriously, you've got a chance in this new world without all that funding, without all that support at the centre. Um, some of you would have seen the Rita Pearson video. I love it. it. She talks about every child deserves a champion. It's just a two-minute snippet from Rita Pearson. It's a TED talk. You can find it. Um, makes Every time I, I, I listen to her, it makes my spine shiver. At the bottom, I was and I want you to just see what I've become. And when my mama died two years ago at 92, there were so many former students at her funeral. It brought tears to my eyes, not because she was gone, but because she left a legacy of relationships that could never disappear. Can we stand to have more relationships? Absolutely. Will you like all your children? Of course not. <laughs> and you know your toughest kids are never absent. <laughs> Never. You won't like them all, and, and, and the, the, the tough ones show up for a reason. It's the connection, it's the relationships. And while you won't like them all, the key is they can never, ever know it. So teachers become great actors and great actresses, and we come to work when we don't feel like it, and we listen to policy that doesn't make sense, and we teach anyway. We teach anyway, because that's what we do. Teaching and learning should bring joy. How powerful would our world be if we had kids who, who were not afraid to take risks, who were not afraid to think, and who had a champion? Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Is this job tough? You betcha. Oh God, you betcha. But it is not impossible. We can do this. We're educators. We're born to make a difference. Thank you so much. So we do have to run Man, uh, it was really interesting. David Cameron put a bit of clash on for me, and I plan to finish with Stronger. Um, this is what he said. But now I'd like to say people can change anything they want to, and that means everything in the world. People are running about following their little tracks. I am one of them, but we've all got to stop just following our own little mouse trail. People can do anything. This is something that I'm beginning to learn. People are out there doing bad things to each other. It's because they've been dehumanized. It's time to take that humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. Greed, it ain't going anywhere. They should have that in a big billboard across Times Square. Without people, you are nothing. That's my spiel. And I just want to finish. Um, that's, that's what we have, is our, our, kind of our mantra at Huntington. You work hard with your kind and make things right. 
I just want to finish. It's been a really tough week. And I missed a few things this morning because I was um, getting all this together. Um, because it's been tough. And our, one, of my, one of my loveliest colleagues, um, who has been ill for a time, Suzanne, died on Thursday. So it's been a hard week. And talking to the staff on the Friday morning, yesterday morning, um, to tell them, what, tell them the news, you know, in terms of what heads do, it's been not easy. So I just want to finish with this. This is um, for Suzanne, and it's a late fragment by Raymond Carver. Um, and did you get what you wanted from this life, even so? I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. It's what we all want. It's what our children want. It's what our 